So Nikki Perfect is an internationally renowned expert trainer specialising in communication, negotiating and influencing skills. And I will let her introduce herself fully. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much, A, for your patience and B, for being here, because I know that sometimes in a busy world, it's really difficult to take a few hours out of your day to come and listen to somebody giving a presentation. So I'm really grateful for that. And I'm really grateful that you've invited me here today as well to what I believe is your first one. So that's a real privilege for me to be here. So I'm going to talk to you today for the next couple of hours. We will have a break as well, don't worry, about the art of communication, but from a hostage and crisis negotiator's perspective, which is what my trade was for over a decade. And we're going to talk about communication and how you can use it. And some of you might be sitting there today already thinking, oh, uh, already thinking, uh, well, actually, I'm, I think I'm okay at uh, communication and perhaps in a pretty good communicator. And I felt exactly the same until I went on my hostage and crisis negotiation course, where they literally stripped me down from everything I believed to be true and gave me a different way, a way that allowed me to build relationships incredibly quickly in a very short space of time. And I'm gonna share with you some of those skills today. Next slide, please. Now, the next slide is gonna say, please be aware. If we can move it across. Natalia, are you able to... Um, move it across at all? Ah, oh, there we go. Please be aware. So, and the reason I put please be aware on is there's a couple of things. We are going to talk about listening today. And the when you we have finished that lesson or the conversation about listening, you will start to become far more aware around how people listen around you. So uh, please don't blame me when you realise that a lot of people don't actually listen to you. Um, uh, and that we don't actually listen to each other very well sometimes. So that's my first. The second one is I have three crazy dogs who are very quiet at the moment and they hopefully are on their best behavior. But if they suddenly go mad um, and you hear them, I do apologize for that. And the third one is this is my favorite subject. And when I get excited about talking, I talk really quickly and I start to go a little bit high pitched. So if I am talking a little bit quickly for you, please just put something in the chat and Rachel will tell me to slow down. So when we talk about communication, most of the time we hear it referred to as a soft skill. And I'm going to invite you today over the next couple of hours to maybe rethink that if that's the way you do the communication. But before we go into any of that, let's address the elephant in the room, which is, of course, my surname, which is perfect. Uh, it really is perfect. As my dad always says to my mum, he was born perfect and she only became perfect when she met and married him. He still thinks that's the funniest joke in the world. Uh, he's 82 and every time I give a presentation, I am um, always open with that in honour of him. Next slide, please, Natalia. Thank you. So uh, often we talk about communication being a soft skill. Next slide, please. And I'm going to suggest that it's not a soft skill but it's actually a life changing and a life saving skill. And we're gonna talk about why, why I believe that to be true. And we're gonna also talk about the power of communication and how you can make a difference every single day in someone's life. Next slide, please. In fact, you can go to the one after that as well, please, Natalia. Lovely. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about me so you know who I am and why I'm here. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about you. And really, the next couple of hours is about you and it's about taking time out of your very busy lives and reflecting on who you are, how your brain operates, why you say and behave in the way that you do. So the first part of this session is going to be all about us and our brains and how we work. And then the second part will be more about some skills and implementation and some things you can take away from today. Now, the great thing about this is it won't just work with the people that you are involved with day to day in your working environment, your patients and your teams. It will also work at home. If any of you have teenagers, it works with them, although you have to make sure that you're at a specific emotional level um, before you try it on them. I have a 15 year old in my life who is a giddy pig. She doesn't know it. Uh, sometimes she catches me out. 
but for the majority of time I use I certainly use these skills on her and also my partner. So this is a little bit about me. I became a negotiator in 2008. I had 31 years experience of policing. I joined as a very young, naive 18 year old in 1986. I know you're probably looking at me and thinking that's impossible, Nick. How can that be? Uh, but it is true. I am 53 and I always knew I was going to once I joined the police cadets, I kind of always knew I was going to be a police officer. And then sort of 20 years into my career, I was a inspector on the firearms team and I wasn't really enjoying the posting on the firearms team. It, it wasn't really me and I couldn't work out why I didn't feel like I quite fitted. And there was a, a lady who came onto our team called Helen Ball, who was a superintendent at the time. She's now the deputy commissioner of the Met. And she uh, said to me, have you ever thought about becoming a negotiator? And I said, no, I haven't. I'd worked with negotiators, especially in firearms, and I'd worked with them throughout my policing career, but I'd never really thought about how you became a negotiator. I was always, always thought it just kind of happened, you know? And anyway, I found out a little bit more about it and I thought, oh, actually, I'd really like to give that a go. I applied, you have to go for an interview, big old paper sift and then some role plays. And I finally got onto my course in December, 2008. And I went on there thinking, this will be okay. I think I can communicate. And literally they, as I said, they worked me really long hours for two solid weeks, put me under a lot of pressure, put the spotlight on me uh, 24 seven. So everything I said and everything I did was analyzed and questioned why, why and what, and what was the reasoning for it. And I came out of that course, um, having learned two incredible things about myself. One was that I, actually there was a different way of doing something that I'd never been told. So I didn't know what I didn't know. And the other one was I had an epiphany moment there and then and decided that that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my career and certainly the rest of my life. And so in 2012, I was lucky enough to apply and be successful in becoming one of six full time members in the UK. So most police negotiators do it on top of their normal day job. So they uh, are they're volunteers, although volunteer is the wrong word, but they want to do something extra to their day to day policing. Most of them don't get paid for doing that. They do an on call rotor 24 seven, 365 days a year. And uh, there was at that time in 2012, just a small team of six people working out of New Scotland Yard who were lucky enough to have negotiation as their full time job. And I managed to get onto that unit in April 2012, uh, which my mum loved because she, now she could tell everybody uh, who she knew that Nick worked out of the yard. So I sounded like some exciting character in a TV programme for her to share with her friends. And it was a real privilege and an honour to actually get that job. And I was able to travel around the world teaching hostage and crisis negotiation. I became the director of UK training in 2013 and also travelled around the world representing Her Majesty's government when a British national was caught up either in a incident like a terrorist incident like Bataclan Theatre or if they were kidnapped whilst they were abroad. So if you had told me at the age of 18 that, that I would be doing that at the back end of my career for the last decade, I would have laughed and not believed it to be true. So I do honestly feel a privilege and honour to have been able to serve and, and do that. I left policing in January 2018. I learned three incredible lessons. I learned lots of lessons, obviously, but these three ones that really stand out for me. The first one was, we all have a story. So what you, you see is generally the tip of the iceberg conversation. And most of us have our own stories that some of us will share with other people and some of us won't. The second one is that we will all have a crisis at some stage in our life, sadly, and that crisis can take a any sort of form. It could be as simple as losing a set of keys when you're trying to get somewhere important. It could be a, ch a change going on at work. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be moving house. It could be the breakup of a relationship. We all suffer at some stage a crisis and we'll have those emotional reactions. And the third one is that loneliness is one of the biggest killers in the UK. And I don't even mean that people living on their own. What I mean by that is uh, you can be in the busiest place in the world, but if you're if you're having a challenge of your own and you're internalizing it, it can feel like an incredibly lonely place. So I retired. I ended up um, buying my local village garage, as you do, um, and I converted the car showroom into a coffee shop and a gym and kept the garage workshop. So I created a community centre 
in one space. And I, I came to realize I did that because my highest value is to be in service. And I also never really wanted anybody in my community to be lonely if they didn't want to. Um, I was lucky enough to be honored in the New Year's, well, in fact, the Queen's last New Year's honors list uh, with a British Empire Medal for my work to the community in the uh, COVID time. So I feel really honored um, and amazed actually to have that award. So that is a little bit about me. So these are some of the places that I went to. The Cayman Islands you'll see on there. I don't know if any of you have been to the Cayman Islands. It was a tough gig, obviously, white beaches, uh, turquoise blue sand. Um, and I went over there, I was very lucky. It was, uh, I think there was a little reward from my boss, but I went over to the Cayman Islands. They'd had an incident of kidnap and never had one before. So they wanted some negotiation training. Next slide, please. And these are some of the incidents that I've been involved in. Some of them you may or recognize is uh, I joined in 2012, which was the same time that ISIS were taking over Syria. And unfortunately, there was a lot of kidnappings of Westerners. John Cantley, you'll see on the, le on the left there, he's still missing. Uh, he was kidnapped. He was one of the first people I dealt with in an international kidnap. He was kidnapped with Jim Foley, who was very sadly beheaded in 2014. Alan Henning and David Haynes were also beheaded by ISIS. And then there's some other bits and pieces, some kidnaps in Afghanistan, uh, an Egypt plane, Egypt plane hijacking where the guy had a big uh, vest, um, explosive vest on, which turned out to be a fake, but we thought it was real at the time. And of course, Bataclan Theatre, where sadly many people lost their lives. And I was involved in that and, you know, just an incredible experience to have had. So that's just a little bit about me. So we're going to talk a little bit more about you and how you work and how you operate. Next slide, please. If you get any questions, as I say, please put them in the chat. I will leave some time at the end of each session, this, this hour's session and the next one for uh, any questions. So let's talk about human behaviour. And the first box you'll see over there on the left hand side is how your brain is split. Now, I, well, I, of course, your brain is split into far more pieces than just two parts, but I just want to imagine that there's your brain, split your brain down the middle, and on one side is your emotional brain, and on the other side is your logical brain. Now, what happens is that our emotional brain is five times stronger than our logical brain. There's a great book called The Chimp Paradox, where this is explained um, really clearly and will help you to understand a little bit more about why that happens. And I'm going to suggest that a lot of the people that you talk to through your everyday work are people who are in crisis of some sort. Maybe it's because they can't get to see a doctor. Maybe it's because uh, something's happened. Perhaps they need injections to go abroad and they've left it too late. Uh, and then that's your fault, right? Um, not their fault for not booking it. Um, I get the same with MOTs at the garage, which, which, which is interesting to watch people go from very logical, I need to book this in, to very emotional when we say, well, actually, we have a two week list and they realise that their um, MOT is, is well out of date by them. And our emotional brain takes over and it protects us. It's designed to protect us. It's part of the primitive brain. It's there. It's very subconscious. But what it does is it kicks in to protect us when we are feeling threatened. And we can feel threatened about a lot of things. It used to be, you know, when we were uh, running away from bears, living in caves, wanting to be part of, knowing that we had to be part of the social circle to survive. But now it protects us from a fear or a perception of a fear. So it might be something like, um, I don't want to put my hand up in a meeting because I don't want to look stupid here. Or it might be because you have dealt with uh, 59 people already that day who have been horrible to you and the 60th person just pushes you over the edge. So your brain goes into that emotional reaction to protect you. So what are some everyday sort of examples of when that emotional brain kicks in? Now, I know I'm a woman 53, so that I can be incredibly emotional. Uh, thankfully, my role as a negotiator has taught me how to manage that well and to press the big pause button. But that some of the things that affect me and perhaps you can relate to them are this. So anybody here ever lose their keys? Hands up if you ever lose your keys. Great. So I can see hand, some hands up because that would be weird if I was the only person. That would be a really boring story. But 
do you ever lose your keys when you have loads of time or do you lose your keys when you're in a rush and trying to get somewhere yeah it's always that second one isn't it so this is this is how my household goes a little bit in the morning so as i told you i've got um three dogs i've got a 15 year old i've got a partner we've got some chickens i've got five goats and a pig all of whom need looking after and getting ready in the morning so i, I was off to london to be interviewed for some for a training role and um i was looking for my keys and i couldn't find them anywhere now we have a utility room with a key rack which tells you a little bit about me and i was looking for my keys on the key rack and they weren't there now of course i always put them there it's just what always happens right and so they're not there so i'm shouting this uh has anybody seen my keys nothing nobody answers because they're all really busy now i have a little belief system going on here okay so when i was 18 and i joined the police cadets there was a consequence for being late and that consequence was that you would lose your weekend freedom you wouldn't be able to go out of an evening and you'd have to do all the rubbish jobs like picking up litter so i have had it drummed in and drilled into my brain since the age of 18 that if you're late you look really unprofessional and people won't want to work with you and there is a consequence to that behavior so subconsciously that's in my mind and my emotional brain knows that and it kicks in so i now have a little bit of internal dialogue going a bit like this they won't want to work with you if you're late they're just going to look stupid they're going to think you're really unprofessional it's going to be a massive consequence to that and I know, i'm not even aware of this but what i am aware of is that my body is changing that i'm starting to get sweaty palms that my heart is starting to beat a little bit quicker and that my voice is starting to get a little bit harsher a little bit louder and my language is becoming a little bit more aggressive perhaps you can relate to this so i'm going to shout it again hey has anyone seen my keys nothing tumbleweed so now i'm going to go into blame mode because i need to protect myself and so to protect myself it's clearly sabotage somebody has crept in overnight into the utility room taken my keys and hidden them so i can't make it to this appointment which of course isn't true right so now i'm going to use blame language who has moved my keys nothing and then i get the one question from my partner that's going to send me into apoplexy and you know what that question is right where did you last see them and of course if i was in a logical perspective and logical brain that would be a great question to ask because i would go right hang on a sec what did i do when i came in where are my keys but i'm not i'm in emotional brain and so like that's just the worst question you could possibly ask me that is an everyday example of the emotional brain taking over the logic logical brain um another example is road rage how many people have road rage oh, i know some of you do i know you do where people like cut you up you hold the horn maybe flash the lights maybe mutter something underneath your breath and road rage is another unconscious example of emotional behavior and I would just ask you to think about where does your emotion show up and how does it show up? Do you become that aggressive person or do you become a submissive person? And submissive people will generally just withdraw and they won't participate. They won't share their views. They'll start to internalize. Um, maybe they'll try and change the subject. Whereas an aggressive person is more likely to talk over you, uh, not let you finish your sentences and will. Uh, talk about you behind your back especially if you have an idea that they're not in agreement with and people who are who who fear change will often do that they'll either go submissive or aggressive especially if you're going for a period of change and probably you see this sort of behavior from some of your your patients some of the people that you come into contact on a day-to-day -day basis with they might well be in that em emotional brain because they're trying to work out um when 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 to come and see you and that they might want to see a doctor or something might have happened in their life and they need some reassurance from you so not are you only are you very emotional but now i'm going to talk about you that middle figure the what's in it for me so we as human beings are pretty selfish uh, i just like to caveat that with there's nothing wrong with that um, because we do come at life from our own perspective and what's in it for me so is this worth my time 
is this worth my money? What will other people think of me? And so what value will I get from that? And it's a good thing to have because again, it protects us. And again, it, it makes sure that we are doing things that fit in and align with who we are as people and our values. So that's so you're emotional and selfish. Things aren't going great at the moment. Now I'm going to tell you that none of you listen. So the third one is about listening. And the most of the time we don't listen. We come from a we, we listen in a very passive way or a competitive or a combative way. And we'll talk about those later on after we've had a break. So there we go. That's generally in a in a nutshell how we work. And that shows up in the way that we communicate. Now, our emotional brain is often triggered by what we believe to be true. So I always say this, every morning when you get up, imagine you put a pair of glasses on. And when you look at the world through that pair of glasses, you see it according to your belief system, according to your value system, according to your experiences. Now we as emotions in general, and I'm talking about majority here, have the same emotions wherever you go. I've been lucky enough to travel around the world and meet with many different cultures. And I notice the same emotions being displayed. The thing that makes us so unique is our own experiences. And that's what gives us our uniqueness. And that's why we're all different from each other. So we're gonna look at beliefs and values and what they are and what happens when somebody challenges those. And first of all, I'm just gonna share with you a story about my first ever police negotiation. So I want you to imagine the scene. I've completed my negotiation course. I've done two really full on weeks of being trained, rebuilt, spotlighted, pressure, I'm exhausted, but I'm also excited because I have a new skill. And perhaps you can relate to this, but when you have a new skill, if you've learned something, you kind of want to go and put it into practice and see how it's going to change and uh, save people's lives. That was what I felt I was going to be able to do. So I haven't had a call for a while. I, I've had a couple of like deployments, but I, they've either finished before I got there, I've been cancelled before I've even left the house, um, or I've something else has happened and I've never really made it. So I've never had a negotiation. So I'm getting ready for bed one night. It's about, about 11 o'clock at night and my work phone goes. And in the middle of my work phone says the name Steve. And now I'm excited. And when I'm excited, I get the same stress levels, the same sweaty palms, the same heartbeat, the same little knot in the stomach. And I'm excited because Steve is one of the guys that taught me how to be a negotiator. And so I know what's coming. So I answered the phone and I went, hi. And he said, hi, Nick, it's Steve. I know you're not on call tonight, but we've got an incident happening about 10 minutes away from where you live. Can you go? And I was like, oh my goodness, yes, of course I can go. I didn't think of any of the consequences about what was gonna happen the next day at work or um, how who, who was gonna look after my dog or any of those things. I was just like, yes, I'm there, tell me what's going on. So he said, right, this is what's happened. The young, a young guy has been released from prison very recently. He's gone round to see his uh, daughter who he's never seen before. She's two to three months old. And there's been an altercation with his ex-partner. She's alleging that he has assaulted her and he's taken the child. He's uh, been involved in a car chase around South London and he's now surrounded by police, but he's holding the child as like a, a, a defence so that the police can't, come near him in the car he's holding the child up and there's obviously some real concerns for the child's welfare she's very young she's away from mum um, and all sorts of things are going on in the background he said can you go and negotiate with him and I said yeah absolutely so I get my bag ready and I'm waiting for what's called a fast car the fast car is a, a marked police car that comes and picks you up and takes you to the scene on blue lights and, and two tones and gets you there so I'm waiting for that car to arrive so as I'm waiting for the car to arrive, I've got this going through my head. This is how I'm playing it out in my own mind. Okay, This is my belief system. Heroin negotiator, moi, arrives on scene, is able to talk to the young man in his car. He listens to her. She listens to him. He, hold, he hands her the child, shakes her by the hand and is gently led away by police officers. Mm, right. 
So what really happened uh, was he didn't talk to me for eight hours. He, no, sorry, he said two things to me in, in that eight-hour period. The first one was, you don't understand. You don't understand. And the second one, I'm not going to repeat on a Wednesday afternoon. But I just want you to hold that scenario because we're going to come back to it and I'm going to use it as an example. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what a belief is. So a belief is an internal feeling that something is true, even though that belief may be unproven or irrational. So a belief can really be anything. Some people will say religion is a belief. For the, those of you that have a strong religion, you will say, no, that's real. That's not a belief. It's my faith. And that's strong. But for those people that don't have a religion, they will say, well, well you know, it doesn't exist. So you've got two conflicting beliefs there already. You might believe that something is true because it's always happened in your life and it's that's always been a representation of your childhood and so you'll carry that that belief that that belief is true people live and die for their beliefs we talked about isis right at the very beginning they have a very strong belief system where they are willing to die and to die for that belief you have people like gandhi like martin luther king who will stand up and put their heads above the parapets because they believe so strongly in something. So never underestimate the power of a belief. And what happens is when somebody challenges our belief, it can feel like they're challenging us and it can cause that emotional response. And then our, our emotional brain kicks in and our behavior and our be communication become very different from how they would be when we felt comfortable, and safe and secure. So when people challenge what you believe to be true, what reaction do you give them? Are you, do you go, do you become aggressive or do you become submissive? Do you let people talk over you um, and don't push your belief forward? Or are you very like, no, that's not right. This is right. I remember uh, Meg going to school when she was about six or seven and coming home from school and saying, can you go through my maths homework with me? And I was like, yeah, of course they can, honey, no problem at all. And we sat down and I showed her the way that I had been taught. <laughs> she looked at me, see if I had two heads and went, that is not how you do maths. That is completely wrong. Because of course she'd gone to school and had a whole new way of learning and a different way that I'd ever been taught. And that was her belief system. So I got a real pushback from her. Other belief systems, other belief systems you probably come across day to day will be people who believe that they have that they need to see the doctor there and then and that it cannot wait for another day and that they they don't understand that perhaps there's a, a booking in system or whatever that might be they'll give you an emotional response on it a belief system from my negotiation days is there was a young girl standing on the edge of a building and i was talking to her and her belief system was that nobody cared about her now, my belief system, coming from a, a place where my, I have good family relationships, I, I have strong friendships, is that there must be somebody in the world that cares about you. And actually, right here, right now, in this moment, I care about you. But you can imagine that that young girl who had this such a strong belief system that she was deciding whether to live or die today, that when, when she says to me, nobody cares about me, and I turn around and say well, I care about you, you can imagine the response. The response was, how can you care about me? You don't even know me. You don't know anything about me. Because I challenged a belief that she was holding on to be true. And I learned a lot from that negotiation as well. And I never say that anymore. I just say what I see and let them give their emotion to me. So beliefs can be incredibly strong and you will have your own belief systems, whether that be about parenting, whether that's about how you spend Christmas in this country. That's a really strong one. You know, we all have an idea of what Christmas should look like. And sometimes that causes a rub when we meet somebody new. Let me give you an example of Jack and Jane. OK, so Jane loves Christmas. She has a big family and she spends it with them every single year. And they go to her mum and dad's house. All the partners come, they go Christmas Eve and they leave the day after Boxing Day. And it's just a fun time of celebration. Jack, on the other hand, he uh, believes Christmas is an awful time because when he was young, his dad would go to the pub all day, come home, throw the Christmas dinner on the, on the floor and slap his mum, then fall asleep in the chair. And that would be Christmas Day. 
So Jack is like, I'm never having a Christmas like that again in my life. So from the age of 16 onwards, he's gone skiing every single year because he loves skiing. So imagine his surprise when he buys a surprise trip to go skiing for him and Jane uh, over Christmas, that the response that he gets from Jane is very different from the response that he's anticipating and goes a little like this. You're so selfish. You never think about me. Why have you done that? Who wants to go skiing? And it ends up in a big row. And all because they both had very different belief systems about how Christmas should be spent. Perhaps you have got children yourself and you can relate to this about parenting that you've that you um, have entered into a partnership. You have children and you have very different views on parenting and it causes friction. Or perhaps your parents have very different views on how you're parenting your child. And that causes friction because of that belief system. Next slide, please. And then we have values and the value is a measure of the worth that, of importance that you attach to it is how you live your life. So, for example, if family is a strong value to you, you will have a role or look for a job whereby you can spend lots of time with your family. If fitness and health is very important to you, you will make sure that you have uh, your fridge is stored with healthy food, that you make time to go to the gym every day. If nature is important to you, you'll find a way to get out side and walk amongst nature so we live our lives generally according to our values and if you look at the people around you now some of you are probably like looking around going smiling at each other but you because of the role that you're performing you've probably got very similar values to those people that you're working with because we often in life surround ourselves with people who are like us because we like people who are like us because it helps us to feel safe and it helps us to feel secure and it helps us to um, feel validated. And we like to be right as human beings. We can't help it. We like to be right. And often we'll find people who will make us right because we know that they think the same. So we'll give our opinion to them and they'll say, yeah, absolutely. You're right on that. I have two really good friends. One I go and speak to when I want to be right. And the other one I go and speak to when I want the truth. So, yeah. And they also how we've learned other people behave so sometimes when we come up against people and find it really difficult to communicate with them and we can't work out why but it's often because they behave in a different way a different way than we would expect them to behave so if we have a belief a strong belief and somebody so for example you might have worked in the same place for a long period of time and you're very comfortable working in that same place you know the routine, you know the day-to-day -day work, and that's great. And then you get a younger person come in who's the manager, and they want to implement change. And they want to change a lot of things that you believe work. And that's going to cause an emotional response. And you probably feel you'll give a little bit of a pushback and go, I don't want to change. I don't want to change. Why, are we do, why do we have to change? This has always worked. There's no, there's no, there's no sense to me my belief system to make it change because I'm comfortable here and often when we in implement change and it feels new and it might feel a bit scary and there might be new systems that come in sometimes there's a fear there that's holding that belief um, when we go abroad in the UK we we love to uh, queue and talk about the weather don't we that's what we do we're never happier than if we're standing in a queue talking about the weather and so when we go to different uh, cultures and countries and there's not a queuing system it feels a bit weird and a bit alien that everybody's suddenly pushing past us because our system and our culture is to queue and your values will be given to you by a variety of ways they will be given to you by the country that you were born in and brought up in they will be given to you by the region of the country uh, by the street of the region of the country and by the house in that street in the region of the country and by those people that have had that immediate care for you. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. And Morris Massey is a psychologist from America and he's looked at values and he says there's three stages. So for those of you that have got children, you'll be able to relate to this. For those of you that have um, have been a child, you'll be able to relate to this as well, unless you are the perfect teenager, of course. 
But the first bit is not to seven years, the imprint period. And this is where you're soaking things up like a sponge, okay? And you're learning from other people. Then you get the modeling period where you're eight to 13 and you're starting to get your own point of view. You're starting to listen to your peers at school or wherever you might be. And you're starting to use language that they probably use. You know, uh, for those of you that have got children, when the kids come home and they say something to you and you're like, where have you got that from? Because we never say that. And that's what's happening. Teachers play a massive part here because they start to model um, the experience and the values and the belief system then you start to form your own belief systems and for those of you that have got teenagers you might find that your values and beliefs start to rub a little bit because they're getting their own experiences and they're pushing back a little bit so they might not necessarily believe that what you say is true but actually my friend Sally over here she said this and I believe that to be true and suddenly there's a little bit of conflict a little bit of emotional pushback on both sides because the teenager will have the emotional response, which will cause an emotional response from you. Next slide, please. And then we have the attitude, and this is how we express ourselves in our communication and our behaviour. And it's all about our values and beliefs again. It all comes back to those values and beliefs. And the reason I spend this first hour talking about values and beliefs is because I just want you to start reflecting on what do you believe to be true? In my first ever negotiation, I believed that I was going to be the heroine, that I had this great new set of skills and that I was going to be able to save life wherever I went. And when I arrived at that scene, I left that negotiation thinking, so the result of that negotiation, I'll share that with you, is that the guy ended up being, um, I managed to persuade him to put the child down on the seat and he ended up being tasered. The child was safe. Um, he was not happy. Of course, you know, he was rearrested. And I walked away from that negotiation thinking I failed. What happened? How was I unable to use those skills that I'd been taught? And this whole, you know, I really wanted to, this new career, this new role in communication and negotiation. Why wasn't I able to, to solve that problem there and then? And I realised it was because it was all about me. Every single part of that negotiation had been about me. It had been, I was going to do this. I was going to do that. I was going to be the heroine. Not once had I stopped and put myself in his shoes. Here he was, a young man of colour, just released from prison, um, in a car surrounded by police officers, with his child who he had never seen. And here I was, a white middle-aged woman, woman that probably represented to him just being a police officer and taking him back to somewhere where he probably didn't want to go. And moving him again away from having a relationship with his daughter. Now, you will all have an opinion on that. And none of those opinions will be right or, or wrong. They will just be what you believe to be true. But when I stopped and reflected and thought about that, I suddenly realised that, especially in conflict management, that the best way to be able to deal with that was to put myself in somebody else's shoes. And one of my mentors said to me, Nick, why don't you, when you're negotiating or, or having a conversation where the other person is in crisis, put one of your feet in one of their shoes and keep the other foot in your own shoe and walk along with them. And I've done that ever since. And that was a really powerful thing that he said to me. Next slide, please. So when we put all of this together, this is something called Batari's box. And it basically shows up every day in whatever you're doing in life. Because your attitude affects your behavior, affects my attitude, affects my behavior. Sorry, those boxes are the wrong way around there. So it's, it's your attitude affects your behavior, affects my attitude, affects my behavior. And it's like this circle, this cycle, that until somebody stops and breaks it, the conversation just snowballs. And it could be that you just pick up the phone and you're in a good mood and somebody is immediately aggressive towards you. And so your attitude now changes a little bit. You've gone from I'm in a really good mood to, oh, I'm feeling a little bit defensive now or offensive. And so my communication or my behavior changes a little bit. I might be a little bit shorter with you. 
I might be a little bit more forceful with you than I would be. I might talk over you. And then what happens is that the other person's going to react to that. Another example is road rage. It's a classic. You're driving along because you believe you have the right of way because of the highway code in the UK, right? It says you have the right of way on a main road. Somebody cuts you up. And so you were fine, but now someone's cut you up. So your attitude has changed, which changes your behavior. You might flash the lights. You might swear. You might honk your horn. Now that's going to have an impact on their behavior. They might go, oh, I'm really sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. Or they might start to press the brake lights and they might just start to slow down a little bit and you're going to react to that and so on and so forth until somebody breaks the cycle. Uh, imagine you go home tonight or you, uh, yeah, go home tonight and you go in and you've had a really good day. You're buzzing and you walk in and uh, just as you get in the door, you put the kettle on and you, whoever lives in the same house as you comes in and slams the door and stomps in throws their bag on the floor and you're like okay um and you go oh hi how was your day and they're like don't talk to me about how my day was uh, where's my dinner i'm hungry and you're like whoa don't talk to me like that just because you've had a bad day don't take it out on me and already you can see that snowball effect happening and the attitude and the behavior changing Okay, that takes us nicely up to our next section, which is going to be listening. So I've caught up a little bit so we can still have our break, which you'll be pleased to hear. Now, just before we go into that break, is there any questions that I've missed? Um, Nothing so far. No, Anita's great. just agreeing and saying patients who do not believe anyone other than a GP can help. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a, that, and that's a really strong belief. I bet you get that on a regular basis, you know, mm. that they are the only person that can help you. Um, and that will be their belief system. Yeah. So if there are no other questions on that, the next uh, half of the lesson is going to be very, we're going to do some interaction. I'm going to ask you some questions and we're going to get, we're going to talk about listening. So what time do you want them back, Rachel? Quarter past? Ten minute Quarter break? Past, yeah. yeah, I think that's fine, yeah. Perfect. So we'll see you at quarter, quarter past. Really interesting, Nikki. Thank you. I love that book, The Chimp Paradox. Yeah, yeah it is a great book. I keep revisiting it and... Um, because you forget, don't you? And you can, and I can feel myself becoming the chimp. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, me too. And then it's just about being able to reflect on what what it is that causes that mm. side of the brain to kick in. What's what's happening for you? Why, you know, why is that? Why is that? Unfortunately, though, it's all very well. You can temper your um, behaviour, can't you? And you think, oh, I mustn't let my chimp. But then the other person's chimp comes up. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that in the second half, because often you're quite right. We are able to press our big pause button. But the other person mm. is still in that very emotional state. So how do we deal with that emotional person? Mm. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the second half around what that looks like yeah because a lot of the time people aren't aware they of that emotional response unless you've yeah had a session like this or read that book yeah you may not realize that actually you're being quite irrational here yeah yeah that's right yeah and it, I, I always find it interesting because you know from my perspective communication is a massive life skill that mm. you use every single day in every single relationship you have and yet it's it's uh, the training for it is minimal. It really is minimal. So we, we're taught how to use systems, but we're not taught how to deal mm. with difficult people or difficult situations. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone's got their cameras off at the moment. Yeah. They're all in um, surgery, though, so I imagine. We're making a quick cup of coffee. Yeah. 
I'm going to turn mine off because I'm going to have a quick comfort break. I just no wanted problem. to make sure there was no one waiting in the lobby or yeah, sure. putting any questions. Right. So I'll see you at court past. Yeah. Uh, folks, just to let you know, during the break, um, I've got a little poll that I've put up, which generates as a word cloud, just around what subjects you would like to see included in future non-clinical PLT sessions. So if you could take the time just to, to fill that out, keep it short, sweet and to the point, because obviously we don't want a sentence, um, because that would um, affect the, the word cloud a little bit. So things like previously mentioned, don't need. Um, just for future future risk, um, things so. Um, so yeah, just short, sweet, to the point, a couple of words, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much.
I've just put a link to the chimp paradox yeah. in the chat group. Perfect, thank you. You um, might want to put a link to your podcast somewhere as well, because I know you, I've been listening to those. I will have a look and see if I can find it. Um, what I'll do is I'll put a link up. Put a, the podcasts are actually on my website as well. So I can you, do that later, Nikki. Okay. I can do that. Okay, for you. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Lovely. Because they're just short little, they're interesting actually, because you can relate it to all different mm. scenarios. All right, we've just got another minute or so, so we'll just uh, let everybody find their way back. And Nita, are you um, back with us? Um, if, if you are, if we could just go to the next slide, that would be great. Sorry, it's Natalia. Oh, sorry, Anita. sorry. I'm reading. Do you know that I'm, I'm reading Anita's message in the chat and doing yeah. the same thing. So I do yeah. apologise, Natalia. <laughs> Thank you. You've been so helpful as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. So we'll go into the second part now, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about listening. We're going to talk about how to have difficult conversations. We're going to talk about reflective language and how we can move people from emotional brain back to logical brain as well. So we have something in the negotiation world called a behavior change stairway, which we use with everybody that we're speaking to. And it works a little bit like this, that you have your initial contact. So in the majority of your worlds, that will be somebody walking through a door or somebody picking up the telephone to speak to you. And that's the very first contact that perhaps they've ever had with you or it might be the first contact of that day that they've had with you. The next step is something called rapport, where we start to build a relationship with somebody. Now, rapport conversations I call our safe conversations because they're sort of, they're the tip of the iceberg, they're conversations, they're the conversations that we are willing to share with people, you know, where it feels safe. And then we have trust and that trust, that's where you get the real honest conversations that's where people will tell you what's really going on for them and what's causing them to have perhaps an emotional response rather than a logical one. And then at, right at the top of that, we have influence and persuade. Now, we can never change anybody. That's not our job in life, no matter how hard we want to, especially if you are a rescuer personality, which is somebody who wants to help everybody. Um, I would definitely put myself in that category. That you're your role in life is not to change people, but is to influence and persuade them to maybe take a different course of action. So as a negotiator, that might be for me to get them to release somebody or to step back from the edge of the building or to eventually come off uh, the roof and downstairs, whatever that might be. And we know that the quickest way to build a relationship with somebody is to listen to them. And I'm, if you've got a pen and paper, I'd just like you to write this down because people often say to me, and in fact, Rachel and I were just having a quick conversation in the break around, you know, it's, it's great understanding your own emotions and being reflective about your own emotional triggers, but you cannot control another person's emotions or the reaction that they will give to you. The only thing you can ever control is how you respond. And sometimes we can't even control that because most of our communication is unconscious and we just go blur before we even know what we've said. Now, sometimes we have a little voice inside our heads that goes like this. Don't say that. Please don't say that. Whatever you do, do not. Oh, no, it's too late. And you've said it. And the voice inside your head knows there will be a consequence from whatever you say. Because when we're in emotional brain, especially, we just say and do things that we're not likely to say and do when we're in logical brain. 
And often we'll say and do it to the people that we are closest to because um, it's safe for us to express ourselves like that. But sometimes we do it in a, a public forum when we get particularly agitated or somebody keeps pushing, somebody keeps pushing and we do our best to listen to them. So what I'd like you to write down is this phrase, people who feel listened to are more likely to listen to you. People who feel listened to are more likely to listen to you. So if you have an opinion or a point of view that you would like to get across, if you are able to press the big pause button and listen to the other person first, we know that that helps us to build trust very, very quickly in very difficult situations. And I should imagine some of you have experience and experience constantly very challenging situations and very challenging people. What is it that makes somebody challenging? And it's generally because there is a consequence to and it's personal to them. So I, no, I noticed, you know, we talked about beliefs and somebody put in the chat that people believe that a GP is the person that will, you know, will solve all their problems and, and help them and that there isn't a different way. And you have to somehow overcome that belief system and they'll push back and give you an emotional response because that's what they believe to be true. And there'll be something underlining that, probably a fear of some sort, maybe a fear that if they see somebody different, they won't get the right result. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that that might be their belief. So we're going to cover modes of listening. And I put the caveat right on at the very beginning about once you learn this stuff and you become more conscious of it, you will see how little people actually listen to you. Um, we know already that most of the time we can only listen about to 70% of the things that are happening. And when we are not right there in the space, that drops um, quite significantly. So let's talk about the four modes of listening. The first one, see if you recognize yourself in any of these. And you probably listen to some people in a different way than you do to other people. So the first one is combative. Now, if you want to see an excellent example of combative listening, then just uh, tune in to Prime Minister's Question Time and you will see an excellent example of combative listening. Because combative listening is like a game of tennis or a game of ping pong where I'm going to hit the ball to you and you're going to hit it back to me. But I'm going to take everything that you say and turn it to make me right. So remember, we said we like to be right. Yeah. And why do we like to be right? We like to be right because we feel valued and validated. That's why we like to be right. And we feel that we have a purpose in the world. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just about understanding and recognizing that that's what we do, that we're selfish and we come at life from our own pair of glasses and our own perspective. So combative listening is generally emotional. You will probably talk over the other person or the other person will talk over you. It can be quite aggressive um, or passive aggressive, you know, where somebody says something like, I know I shouldn't say this, but or they'll um, they'll be nice to you and then they'll be a boom underneath it. You know, uh, I thought you did really well on that project, apart from and then they'll come in with something else that passive aggressive. So they always come across as very charming and very nice. But actually, there's a little bit more going on. So combative listening, you're listening from the perspective of being right. And you will take whatever that other person says and you'll make it right. Now, Brexit, I'm not going to get political, don't worry. But Brexit was one of the most emotional votes I have ever seen from a human perspective. It was fascinating to watch how um, because there was a massive belief system going on there about whether you wanted to stay or go. There was a huge belief system. And what happened was that those people who wanted to stay um, and those people that wanted to, to go, that they had combative conversations. There are still some families in this country who are not talking to each other because of the Brexit vote. That's how powerful emotions are. And that's when we go into combative listening, we're just not listening. We're just listening from our very own perspective and not even trying to see it from somebody else's point of view. Then we have competitive listening. Now, competitive listening is one of my favorite you'll hear this all the time in uh, probably when you're having a cup of tea or a coffee maybe later today or if you've got to get public transport you'll certainly hear it on public transport or if you're picking up the kids after school exactly the same and it goes a little bit like this 
two of my favorite competitive listening conversations are illness and holiday. So the first one will go like this. Hey, how are you today? Oh, you know, I've had a bit of a cold going on. Oh, yeah, there's loads of that going around at the moment, isn't there? My kids were sent home from school with that cold. And yeah, now you say it, actually. I, my neighbour two doors down, they had that cold. It went to their chest. They got pneumonia and they ended up in hospital. Yeah, my aunt Mabel, she's had pneumonia and she and so on. And what it is, is it's a, we're listening, but we're listening for our turn in the conversation. So it's like a it's a nice, safe, rapport building conversation where we share have shared experiences. But actually, we just build on it a little bit more and um, because we like to talk about ourselves. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. I'll let you into a secret. Right. They have done MRI scans on the human brain. And when we talk about ourselves, it lights up the same part of the brain as having sex and taking crack cocaine. And that's why we like to talk about ourselves, because it gives us that big hit. And so when someone listens to us and really listens to us and gets us to talk about ourselves even more, well, well that's amazing. And we walk away from that conversation going, there was something different about that. I feel valued and validated and I'll definitely talk to that person again. But competitive listening is about us and about us sharing our own story. Then we have passive listening. See if you can recognize yourself or anybody else in this. So passive listening is when you're doing something else, but continue to have a conversation with somebody else. So you might be watching your favorite soap opera or football or the news, something you really are passionate about on TV and you like to watch it. And in walks somebody and they start talking to you and you go a little bit like this. Mm hmm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Mm. Because we've learned how to do that. And actually, we're not listening at all. Or the other one is where you're having a conversation and the other person gets their phone out and starts to read a message and they're going, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. And you know they're not really listening. Or perhaps you go and see your boss and they are typing away on an email and you go to the door, you knock on the door, they say, oh, hi, come on in. Yeah, go on, I'm listening. Now you know they're not listening because you cannot do something else and listen fully at the same time. And uh, so they type away, you carry on talking and they carry on giving you that aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, and they walk off uh, thinking, well, I wasn't really listened to. And the other person goes, hmm, I didn't really listen to them. But what we do in society is we've just learned to accept that as the norm. And so when we're the person knocking on the door, Rather than going, oh, I can see you're busy. Uh, have you got two minutes a bit later? I just need to have a conversation with you. We go, we carry on saying what we want to say because we want to get it out. And when we're the person typing, rather than saying to the person at the door, do you know what? I can see this is really important to you. I've just got to send this email and then I'll come and find you and we'll have a proper conversation. We don't do that. We just carry on. So we have these half conversations constantly. Um, then we have active listening and active listening is where you're fully present in the moment. And not only are you fully present in the moment, but you have no judgment. So you get rid of all that stuff. You don't have that internal dialogue going, um, right. What's for tea tonight? Who's picking up the kids? What did that last person say to me? What do I have to do? What list did I have to do for that person? What meeting have I got later on? It's none of that. And for those of you who are sat there now listening, going, what internal dialogue? It's that right there. And because we have this constant, we have constant um, distractions, notifications pinging up on every single device that we have. Um, we're now programmed to answer a ping. You know, we're so used to it. Um, we're programmed to deal with more than one thing at once when actually research shows that when you try and do loads of different things and multitask, you end up doing all of those um not as well as you would do if you did one at a time so there's lots going on in our lives so it's about managing to put all of that to one side and just be there but it's also about listening to what the person isn't saying to you so are they repeating words or okay let's uh, let's have a bit of um interaction i just want you to write some answers in the chat for me here around 
what does when you're a kid and your mum says to you as you go out on your push bike be careful what does that actually mean so you're you're, you're a young kid you're going out on your push bike and your mum goes be careful what does that mean what is she what is she not saying let me put it that way there are no right or wrong answers yeah don't fall off your bike yeah what else is she saying don't break your leg yeah i haven't got time to be in hospital this afternoon yeah don't talk to strangers don't bring trouble to my door what's going to happen don't fall off the bike mind the road yeah What she's probably saying is, um, don't get hurt because I love you. But she doesn't say that. She just says, be careful. Yeah, I'm worried there. Yeah, I'm worried. But I want to let you grow up and be independent. Absolutely. So she's say, saying loads of things without really saying them. And that's what we're listening for, is what are you telling me that you are not saying? And when we uh, are present and fully present, and when we use reflective language, that really helps us to get a better understanding of what's going on. The other thing that it does is it helps to diffuse the situation. And when we are able to reflect back what the other person has said to us, we keep it about them. We already know we love to talk about ourselves. We keep it about them and that helps that other person to feel valued and validated and special in that moment. It also allows their emotional brain to switch into their logical brain. So it buys them time. It also buys you time to allow your emotional brain to switch into your logical brain. And the way that we can do that is either just um, uh, echoing what they're saying back to us or just summarizing. So I often say, if you're having a conversation with somebody, listen as if you have to summarize that conversation at the end because that will make you be present and that will make you be in the moment. So when somebody phones you up and, and they're um, perhaps they're quite aggressive and say, I need to see a doctor now. And I would, I would say something like, gosh, you sound really worried and that it's really important for you to see a doctor. Yeah, I am really worried. Oh, great. Now I know you're really worried. So what are you really worried about? And I'm just reflecting back their language and then they're more likely to tell me, like that conversation where you come to the door and I'm typing away and I say, go ahead, I'm listening, rather than give me two minutes and I'll come and find you. And so we start to recognize how people are feeling and we can say to them, well, you sound really angry or you sound really frustrated or you sound worried or um, let me get this right. You want to see a doctor because you're really worried about the pain in your hand. Yes, that's right, great. So now I've got more information. So it allows everything just to settle down. And when we talk about reflective language, we talk about using summaries. In fact, I'll just talk about two today because we haven't got that much time, but I'll talk about summaries and use of emotional language. So what we often do is we often say things like, stop shouting, or don't talk to me like that, or calm down is another favorite one. Um, and I'm not just saying we do this at work, we do this all over the place. You know, we do this when we interact with our family. I certainly do. I know I do this with my 15 year old, but like, listen to me, things like that. So we label the behavior first. If we label the emotion first and then the behavior, it has a more powerful effect. So let me give you an example. So your child comes home from school. Let's say your child is called Lucy. She comes home from school and you can see that Lucy's not very happy. So you go, hey, Lucy, are you OK? And she goes, no, actually, I'm not. I've had a really bad day. I don't know what's happened. Well, uh, Amanda, the most popular kid in school, um, told me I was ugly in, a, in the, in the uh, line going to lunch in front of everybody. Now, as a parent or a sister or an auntie or whoever you might be, your protective nature immediately wants to smother them in love, show them that you care and say something along the lines of, don't, just ignore Amanda, you're beautiful. She's so stupid, Look, you're, just, you're amazing. Just ignore her and it'll all be fine. Or something to, words to that effect. And, that, and, all, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we haven't done is we haven't validated how they're feeling. 
So if we just change that slightly and said something along the lines of, gosh, that sounds like that was a really embarrassing moment for you today. Yeah, it was. And what particularly was embarrassing about that? Well, because she made me look stupid in front of all of my friends. But what we've done is we've gone, do you know what? I'm not going to tell you how to deal with this and problem solve it for you. But what I am going to do is I'm going to validate your emotions. So when people do phone and they're angry and frustrated, just, just switch around a little bit and say, you sound really angry. You sound really frustrated. And see what happens. See if you get a different reaction and see if you can then bring them down to from emotional brain to logical brain. Um, I'm just trying to think of another example um, around that where you, you can do that. So the competitive listening, right? So the competitive listening one of, um, hey, how are you today? Oh, you know, don't feel so great. I had a cold last week. Oh, it sounds like that was a really challenging couple of weeks for you, a little bit debilitating. Yeah, it was actually. Got a lot going on, so I didn't really need it. Now we get into the heart of the matter rather than this superficial conversation. Another one is holidays in competitive listening. Hey, how are you today? Yeah, I'm great, actually. I just got back from holiday. Oh, wow, where did you go? I went to Italy. Oh, what part of Italy did you go to? I went to Florence. Oh, wow, I've been to Florence. Did you go here? Yeah, I did go here. I stayed in this hotel. Oh, man, we just stayed around the corner from that hotel. Did you manage to get down there? Do you see what I mean? And if we changed it and said something along the lines of, hey, how are you today? Oh, yeah, I'm great, actually. I just came back from holiday. Oh, you've been on holiday. Yeah, I really need to get away. Do you know what work has been manic um, and my mental health is suffering? And now we get to a heart of the conversation and we build that, that staircase to that trust level a lot quicker just by switching it out a little bit. So my top tip is emotion first, behaviour second. I'm not saying accept aggressive behaviour, not saying that at all. I'm saying let's deal with the emotion. Let's get from emotional brain to the logical brain and then we can deal with the behavior. So if you've got a 15 year old kid, like I have who comes in, that might be a little bit tired and uh, well, I don't know, comes in, throws a bag in the corner. And rather than going, hey, don't just throw your bag in the corner. What's up with you? Which I know I do sometimes, that we become more consciously aware. And I go, looks like you had a tough day today. And then we have a chat. And then I go, I appreciate you've had a, a tough day. Could you just put your Put your bag to one side so I don't have an extra job to do later on in the day. And so we can deal with it. So we know that when people feel listened to, they are more likely to listen to you. There's a question up there. How would you get the patient to switch from emotional to logical brain? Yeah, hopefully I'm covering that right now. Yeah, is that you've li- put that. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. And then you listen to them and you use reflective language. So next slide, please. And, and can you just can you, you press it a couple of times to fill the three boxes for me? That's it. Perfect. So we know that we speak at 200 to 300 words a minute. We know that we can hear at 300 to 500 words a minute. And what we end up doing is we make assumptions. We fill in the gaps based on what we believe to be true, especially if you have a quick brain and you'll know if you're a um, a hurry up we call it a hurry up person like a quick brain because you're already jumping ahead you've already answered the, the conversation in your own mind or so my 15 year old has a really quick brain sees me on the phone and and I'll be like oh I'm just trying to do this takes the phone off me and does it for me so you end up doing all the extra jobs because your brain has already gone oh my goodness you're far too slow I need to do that for you some of you will be smiling now because you can relate to that or some of you might be looking at somebody else in the office going oh my god you're so like that so we fill in the gaps and we make assumptions based on what we believe to be true right we're going to do a little exercise and I just want you to, I'm going to ask you some questions at the end of this exercise so for those of you that are on your emails at the moment or checking your phones or um, reading something because you're trying to balance everything at work. I'm just going to ask you to put everything to one side, quieten all the little voices inside your mind, and just listen to the following passage, and then I'm going to ask you some questions on it. When I have gone, I will be at peace. I'm not really enjoying myself anymore. I find it hard to get about. I'm a prisoner in my own home. 
lot of the old crowd have gone and more and more I think it's time for me. I do like your visits, but they also remind me of what life was like. So just whilst you're thinking about that, Natalia, can I just ask you to flick through two slides, please? And stop there. And these are the questions I'd like you to answer. Now, I have a female voice, but you might have heard a male voice. That's not uncommon. So I'd just like you to answer these questions. Who was talking? Male or female? How old are they? Um, what ethnicity are they? Where, what's their background? What are they talking about? And I don't want you to overthink this. I just want you to go with your gut reaction, your gut reaction only. And if you can just answer in the chat, that would be great. Or if uh, you want to come off the mic and give an answer as well, I'm more than happy for you to do that. I'm just aware that there's 121 people on the call, so it might be hard to talk over the mic. Or put your hand up and Rachel might be able to see you. A man getting very old, yeah, and lonely. An elderly housebound woman, thank you. Widowed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of older people coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, residential homes. Dying with cancer, talking to carers, yeah. Some of you have got your own personal experiences here. Thank you for sharing them. Giving up on life, yeah, perhaps talking to their son or, or daughter. Yeah, I thought about someone talking to their child and I had an elderly male as well. I don't know why, mm. really. Yeah. There's no 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 right or wrong. It's just your your gut reaction and your gut reaction will be based on what you your experiences and your values and beliefs. And and some of those things will be conversations you may well have had in your own lives or listened to or heard. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, lots of things. Suicidal thoughts. Thank you for that, Debbie. Um, so. One of the biggest questions I was ever asked when I was a director of UK training, there was this fear around saying to somebody, are, are you feeling suicidal? Are you going to be taking your life, your own life? Are you thinking about taking your own life today? And there's a there was a fear from the students that if they said those words, they would put that thought into the other person's head. And there's been a lot of study and research um, done around those specific words. And does it have an impact on people? And it doesn't. It doesn't put the thought into their head. If people, if I'm talking to somebody who's standing on the, let's say, the wrong side of the barrier on a car park, and I say to them, are you thinking of taking your own life today? Are you thinking of killing yourself? They'll, they'll either say yes or no. They're not going to say, oh, actually, I wasn't thinking about it, but now you've put the thought into my head. Because there's a reason they're the wrong side of the barrier. Or if they're giving you indicators when they're talking to you, perhaps somebody phones to surgery or, or whatever role you might be in and they start talking about, you know, I, I can't see a way forward. I don't know how I'm going to go on. Sometimes we have to have really brave conversations with people. We have to um, take a big, deep breath and say, say what we're hearing and say what we're seeing and get to the heart of the matter. Um, and sometimes we don't do that because we fear that we might offend somebody. Um, or it's not the right thing to do. But when we listen and we reflect back and use that reflective language in summaries and emotional language, then it helps us to get to the heart of the matter very quickly. So the next um, part, I'm going to ask you to read something uh, and we're going to ask you the same questions. So if you could just flick forward one slide for me, please, Natalia. That's it. And I just want you to read this. And again, I'd like you to answer those same questions, male or female. What is happening here and what are you basing your answers on? Again, no right or wrong answers. Female young testifying in a rape case. Thank you. Yeah, met a stranger in a bar.
does it feel like a good situation to you? Or does it feel like there's, uh, this is not going to have a great outcome? Kidnapping. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drugs, yeah. Either sex, yeah. Poor decision making. Now I'm going to ask you to think about that a little bit more. So what is making you say that? You're making, you've, you're reading something into this. There's three lines here. Remember that, just three lines. What is making you say what you're saying? What are you basing it on? Too many detective dramas. Uh, I love that. Um, the word disorientated, yeah. So some of the language in there, disorientated, it seemed dark, he took a route down the streets, I did not know, so it's the words. And this is really interesting around communication because what you're losing when you read is any tone. So if you could just go to the next slide, please. And of course, you know, um, we like to be right. So to prove my point about you'll make assumptions based on your beliefs, and what you believe to be true he got me home so fast i would not have believed it possible so you you know obviously we've, we've done that deliberately to get your brain to have a think about what we're talking about and about making assumptions but with communication what happens is when we're face to face it's a lot easier to communicate because you see the whole picture so you get a feeling for somebody, you can see the nonverbal communication, you can see sort of the, the way that their um, expression is, you get the tone, you get the words, you get that whole feel of it. And that's, that's the ideal way to communicate, it's face to face. Then even here today, we're face to face, but we have a screen. So the screen is a barrier um, because it takes away the feeling. Now, some of you um, have your cameras off. And I totally appreciate that. Why, why that is, because you're, you're at work. Um, sometimes actually having all the cameras on crashes with Teams as well. But now I can't see you. So I can't get that feel uh, and see your reactions. So I'm not sure if uh, you're still with me or if um, you haven't understood something. Whereas if we were face to face, I could see if you gave a quizzical look, I could go, oh, hang on a sec, do I need to explain that again? And then when you take away the tone completely, so you mute your mic as well and just use the chat, then that's all we have. And how many people have had a confused message either via email or text or WhatsApp or whatever social media you might use nowadays? I know that I have sent a message to somebody and got a reply back and you go, what? Where has that come from? Because the message I sent has been received in a completely different way than um, I intended. Yeah, so uh, Joanne, thank you. Yeah, emails, texts, tasks, they have no emotion. So it's really difficult to uh, appreciate what might be going on for the other person. So that there are so many barriers to communication, one of them being the fact that we think that we've actually communicated and the message has been received by the other person. And again, we can overcome this using reflective language uh, because we can use a summary to check in with that other person to see if they've understood what we have said. Or if we haven't fully understood what the other person has said, we can use a summary for that as well. And we can do it in a way a little bit like this. Um, I can hear what you're saying is really important to you. So just to make sure I've got it completely right, this is what I think you're telling me. And then I'll summarize and they'll either say, yes, you got it. They'll say, yes, you got that bit right, but not that bit. Or they'll go, no, that's not what I meant. This is what I meant. And if we're doing it the other way around, we can say, I just want to check that I've managed to explain myself properly uh, that, and that you've understood what I, what I, I mean. Um, can you just tell me what, what I've just said back to you? So, so I, I so I, I, I pre, I, so I know that you've understood what I've said, and then you just get them to repeat it back. But you always kind of take it the responsibility on yourself for doing that and doing it that way. Now the next slide we're gonna. Is there any questions around that listening predictive text? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, predictive text can be an absolute nightmare, can't it? And you end up saying things that um, and you and you read the message back and go, oh my word, that's not what I meant at all. Speed and predictive text. Uh, next slide, please. So just before I move on to give you some tools to take away with you today and implement in any conversation that you want to have with anybody, um, I just want to make sure that there are no questions around what we've covered off in listening. No hands raised at all, we're all good. No questions at the moment. Excellent. So, some things for you to take away if you do have a challenging or difficult conversation coming up and uh, you, you know the ones I mean the ones that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable the ones where you're you're dreading picking up the phone or you're dreading meeting that person because you know you're going to have to have that conversation the conversation that you are avoiding they're generally the conversations we should be having but what happens is many of us don't like what we perceive to be conflict and so we build it up in our head and it becomes this difficult scenario um, and often what we do or perhaps this is just me is that we have a whole conversation in our head with the other person answering for the other person even though the other person isn't there um, and then make a decision based on that conversation we've had in our own heads whereas this is a system that will help you to gain back control so often when we feel that we're being challenged personally, or we feel a little bit out of control of a situation. Um, a typical one would be where a relationship has ended and we didn't instigate that. That throws us into a, an emotional turmoil because we have not been in, that, in control of that situation. Another one might be where uh, by somebody is in pain and they're not in control of it, or they've been told that, that a result has come through and they're not in control of it so they're going to give you emotional reactions this helps to just give you a little bit of uh, time and space it doesn't take very long to do it just gives you a bit of time and space before you go into that conversation so i call it the four p's because i'm my brain works in a really simple way and so i just found it easy so I'll share with you the four P's so the first one is purpose and it's really what do you want from the conversation what is the, what is your goal what's your ideal outcome what are you looking to achieve and it could be as simple as you have to phone a patient to give them um, results of something and actually the that might be very difficult and challenging because the results are not great results whatever that might be or you might have to speak to somebody you might have to speak to somebody and tell them no um because they might keep saying well i need to come in i need to come in and your answer is no so just think about what do you want from the conversation and then we look at a plan and our plan is we we're going to look at every what if possible so that we're ready for it so that we we have dexterity of mind Oh, and we're able to think, OK, actually, I know what they're saying here. Uh, the what if the what what if they don't take no for an answer? What if they suddenly say something out of the blue that you weren't expecting? How how will I keep my emotional brain intact there and not let it spiral out of control and wonder how I'm going to answer that question? What will I do? Well, we already know that if that happens, and um, something comes out of the blue to you that we can stop and we'll go back to active listening and we'll go back to using a summary and we'll go right I can hear this is really important to you I just need to make sure I've got this right and as we go through the summary that will allow our brain to settle down and go back into logical mode and it will allow us to process the information more effectively as well so we're going to have a plan and that that plan could be anything because you already know from your experience generally what people are going to say to you so for example in the world of policing and negotiation if somebody is stuck after an armed robbery and the building is surrounded by police officers i know that one of the things that they are going to say is get the armed police officers away from here or 
I am going to kill somebody. That's one of the probable things that they're going to say. Why are they saying that? What's the real reason for that? That is a fear. And the fear is that they're going to be stormed by the armed police and they're going to get killed. And they probably really don't want that to happen. In fact, they were probably hoping that they would be on their way to the airport with a bag full of cash and going somewhere nice. But here they are stuck in a bank surrounded by armed police officers. So when I open the conversation, I'm going to address that. I'm going to say, right, you've probably looked out the window and seen that you're surrounded by armed police. Um, and I'm guessing that you might be feeling a little bit worried that they're going to come and storm the building um, and there's going to be a big shootout. Let me just reassure you that whilst you're on the phone to me, that is not going to happen. So I've addressed it and it's gone. In your world, um, you can do the same because you'll already understand and have a good working knowledge of what people say to you whether they come in, whether they're on the phone, whether you're dealing with a client or a customer, whatever that might be, there might be lots of pushback that you get that's very similar. So you can deal with it straight away in that sort of opening phrase of the conversation. Then we're gonna look at the world from the other person's perspective. And we talked about this very early on about looking at the world through other people's glasses. And it's really interesting just when we take a little bit of time of, okay, well, how will they be thinking about this? What is their perspective? Uh, what, what might they be going through? What is their fear? What is their worry? You know, what's their belief system? And again, it doesn't take long. And if you have uh, repeat people that come to you, which I'm guessing you do, you probably see, you know, the 80-20 principle, you probably spend 80% of your time on 20% of your clients, uh, like you wear, um, in, in clothing, you wear 20% of your clothing 80% of the time. So um, when you're a manager, you'll spend 80% of your time on 20% of the people. It's called the 80-20 principle. So yeah, it's, uh, and, and, it, and it works in this. So you'll get to know those people that you come into contact regularly and you'll get to know what their conversation will be and what their pushback will be. There's also something called the power of because. Um, another great book to read, especially if you are interested in negotiation or influence and persuasion of people or how the human mind works, Robert Cialdini, he's written lots of books on influence and persuasion. But in his book, he talks about the power of because. And when we give people reasons for something that is going to happen or not happen, then uh, it helps them to settle their brain down a little bit. It comes, it come, some of it comes from child psychology around kids always going, why, 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 why? And they found that actually, if you give a child three to five reasons, good reasons as to why something will or something won't happen, then they're less likely to keep asking why. It doesn't always happen. I appreciate that. We're talking about majorities. So they, they did this experiment on the photocopier, believe it or not, about the power of because. And so they got somebody to go in at lunchtime when the photocopier was really busy in the main office building and see if they could get to the front of the queue. And so they started off by this person going in and saying, uh, do you mind if I just go in front of you? Do you mind if I just go in front of you? And they found that about 63 to 65% of people said, actually, yeah, that's okay. You can go in front of me. So they said, okay, well, let's give them a reason now. Let's give them a good solid power of because why I want to get in front of you in the queue. And so the same person went to the queue and they said, look, do you mind if I go in front of you because my boss has got a really urgent meeting this afternoon and I need to get these papers photocopied? And that 63, 65% jumped up to 95%. So they were like, this is great, but is it the reason or is it just because you've given a, a reason? So they said, right, just give a fanciful reason next time. So they went up to the people in the queue and they went, do you mind if I go in front of you in the queue because I need to do this photocopying? And they... <laughs> Oddly enough, they found that that 95% only dropped down to 93%. So actually, when you give somebody a because, they're more likely to uh, listen to you and accept what you're saying. And then the last one is practice. Practice what you're going to say. I never went to a negotiation without actually just running stuff through in my head. When you send an email, just get somebody you trust to read the email before you send it, especially if you know you're sending it from a little bit of an emotional perspective. File it in drafts, don't press the send button, get somebody you trust to read it through. Or run the conversation by somebody else you trust, maybe a colleague, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, and just run it through. 
or if you like me stand in front of the mirror and run the conversation through and just go oh actually that doesn't sound so great you can even record yourself it sounds like an extreme but what it allows you to do is it allows your logical brain to take over from your emotional brain and for you to approach that subject that conversation from a logical perspective so yeah so they're the four p's they're easy to remember uh, especially if you've got a difficult or challenging conversation coming up and and you want to practice but what we're doing really here this afternoon is making you more conscious of how you communicate as i, I said to the rector it's funny because every single relationship breakdown in the world is down to communication of some sort and we communicate every single day with each other whether that is written or orally or just walking past somebody there is a communication going on and yet we don't really learn this in school apart from um, show and tell you know so we're taught how to talk in front of a, a classroom uh, but we're not really taught how to listen or how to interact or what or listening for what might really be going on behind that person you know, underneath that safe conversation what emotions are going on and why are those emotions really happening if you could go to the next slide please um, here are some sentences to keep rapport with somebody even when you want to be assertive and sort of push forward your perspective or the or the policies or the rules or whatever they might be so we often use the word understand now i've been bitten on many a time by saying i understand i've uh, you know when i've negotiated with somebody who's in crisis and i said oh i understand and they have quite rightly pushed back and said no you do not understand you do not understand me that first negotiation the guy in the car what did he say to me he said, you do not understand. And I didn't. I've never been in prison. I've never been chased by the police. I've never been surrounded by police officers and car. I have a very different background from him. I've never had a child that I haven't been able to see. So I didn't understand. So different words are I appreciate, I respect and I accept. And what that allows you to do is show that you're recognizing but you're not kind of um you're not listening to share your story and do the old oh i understand exactly how you feel i had the same scenario the other week when so and so did this we're allowing that person to feel listened to which allows them to feel valued which allows them to feel validated and will then help you to build that relationship very quickly with them Another one is calm down. How many how many times have you been told to calm down? My partner told me to calm down last week and I was like, I am calm because actually I was calm and I was coming at it from a logical perspective. But in their mind, I wasn't calm and was emotional. So you see, you see how these things snowball really quickly. <coughs> so instead of using something like calm down, we look to use I can see we do that emotional language. I can see you're frustrated, annoyed, angry, sad, whatever it is. Don't be afraid if you get it wrong, because what they'll do is they'll tell you you've got it wrong. They'll go, no, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. I use emotional language for my 15 year old all the time and it works really well. And she tells me when I've got it wrong. But the thing is, we often don't do it. So it feels a little bit clunky. You know, when you first get in a car and you drive it, you get in and you look at all those pedals and all the gadgets here and you're thinking how on earth am i ever going to put all of this together and you do the old bunny hop down the road don't you like that um or you don't see things whatever it might be and then you start to, you pass your test and you get experience and you drive more and you drive more and you drive more and eventually you drive a familiar route from one end to the other and you get to the other end and you go oh i don't even really remember that journey because it's just become a normal behavior and the only time that will change is if something happens out of the ordinary so maybe there's a sudden thunderstorm and suddenly you sit up don't you? you sit up and you become more alert and you're like right i need to switch on now you might even switch the radio off i do that i can't listen and do so i switch the radio off and i'm like in focus or i might wind the window down a little bit and i'm like right i'm in focus i need to be really present in the moment but when you but when you start to emotionally label other people and recognize their emotions and say, gosh, you sound really angry. 
it can feel clunky, like you're starting to do that first journey in your car. But then gradually over time, it becomes very natural and almost an unconscious. And again, some of you probably already do this naturally. I'm just getting you to move from unconscious behavior to conscious communication and being in the moment and thinking, oh, yeah, I know what this is. I can hear what's going on for them here. I'm going to see if I can label it. Um, the old understand one, I had a conversation just two weeks ago with my 15 year old um, and my my partner said to them, oh, yeah, I fully understand what it's like being at school at, at 15 because I was 15. Boom, straight away. You have no idea what it's like to be 15 in 2022. You didn't go through COVID. You didn't have a year out of school. You didn't have to do all your lessons online and wear a mask. And I was like, hmm, really fascinating to watch. And I was thinking, yeah, you're kind of right there. So yeah, really interesting. Once you just start to listen to how people listen to each other and the words that they use and the responses that they start to get. Next slide, please. So there's something in life called the window of tolerance, and this really impacts the way we communicate and behave. And we've talked about this all the way through today for the last nearly two hours. When we feel safe, we can respond in a logical way. When we're in control, we respond in a logical way. When we feel secure, we can process information. And if you think about this in your own life, and I'm guessing most of you have had some sort of crisis or felt out of control at some stage in your life. <coughs> and it might even be as simple as somebody just saying no to you. You know, I see I, when kids get very frustrated when you say no to them because they have no control, you take it off them in the same way that we do as human beings sometimes. And it's that loss of control and that loss of security and that loss of feeling safe. And so we respond emotionally. And most of our emotional responses are driven by a fear. My old mentor used to say to me, if you can identify the loss or the fear of loss, you'll be able to identify the crisis. And he said, but you have to really be present and listen to find out what that loss or what that crisis is, to work out what that crisis is. Because people will only tell you what they want you to hear. They will only show you what they want you to see. When we lose control, we respond emotionally. So, for example, um, you know, when you go on holiday and suddenly your flight is delayed for hours and hours and hours and it starts to eat into your holiday time or perhaps you've got connecting flight. And so we start to respond differently and more emotionally and we start to get a little bit angry at, at what's happening or frustrated and all of those sorts of things. And when we are insecure, it's hard for us to process information because we've, there's too much going on in here. So we can't process the information in the same way that we would do when we're in logical mind. Mm -hmm. This affects you. It affects your team members. It affects people you're dealing with for you. And I just on reflection for you to think about over this next, next week is do you react in an aggressive, submissive or assertive way when you're emotionally triggered? And the other thing I'd just like you to take away from today is to really think about how you listen to people and how people listen to you um, and just start to notice other people's conversations and you'll be able to see when they're in combative mode when they're in competitive mode when they're actively listening or when they're just passively listening next slide please and i'm just going to leave you with my uh, favorite quote from maya angelo which is people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you make them feel. So even in times of frustration, if we can spend a bit of time just being present and in the moment with another person, it has such a powerful impact that you will never know about because nobody will phone you up and say, hey, you know, that was great the way you listened to me yesterday. So you'll be touching people's lives without you even knowing it. And so I'm hoping as we come to the end of today's two hour presentation, that um, when we think about communication, we don't think about it anymore as a soft skill, but actually a life changing and a life saving skill. So I am open to any questions that you might have, or if you've got conversations coming up or you want some guidance in anything at all, then uh, please fire away. If um, maybe we can get rid of the, um, slide deck uh 
Natalia, clear that off and then um, I can just see if anybody's got their hand up or if there's any questions that come in. David Roberts has put awesome. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, I've put Nikki's website in the chat box um, with podcast links and everything for anyone who's interested in listening to those. Any questions at all? It was really interesting, Nikki, and I think we all probably can um, reflect upon our own behaviour and, and realise that, yeah, we do do. I'm definitely guilty of uh, a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> and now when I email everyone, they'll they'll start to realise, they'll think, oh, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they will, yeah, they'll be like checking, checking. Uh, thank that you for the thank yous. Thank yeah. you. Okay. It's um, it's a real, it's a real a pleasure and a real passion of mine. You know, I do. As Rachel says, I, I there is a podcast there that's completely free of charge for you just to go and listen. I try and use everyday examples uh, from the learning and reflection I've had from the conversations I've had with people in crisis over the years. Um, and you know, I'd love to sit here and tell you I nail it every time, but that would be a complete lie. It is, it's about reflecting on the way we communicate and and then building on it from time to time. I still get. I still have emotional conversations. I still run stuff through my head all the time. If anybody has got questions that they think about afterwards, um, mm. please um, send them to me. And then well, we can perhaps ask Nikki. To yeah, and ask. I can either either um, send you them typed out or I can send them you in like a voicemail fashion to yeah. answer the questions. Yeah. But sometimes I think <laughs> you might... Um, Excuse, it's not your fault. <laughs> no, it's not mine, it's yours. Yeah. I'm muting, I'm muting, but... Um... That's okay. And also, if I can just remind everybody that uh, that poll is, is available, if you wouldn't mind filling it out, um, would be very appreciated just so that we get feel for what you'd like included in our future sessions as well, please. I can't see any questions. There's no hands raised. But as you say, that um, often we get questions afterwards, don't we? we? We think about it and go, oh, I wish I kind of asked that. So I think it was really um, interesting and everything was explained really fully. So I think it's that's the reason. I think the questions might come when um, in, people find themselves in d different situations and think, oh, what would I do here or I understand yeah. so yeah so please feel free to um I, I'm going to put my email in the chat box so anyone wants to email me please do with anything or any any queries about further PLT sessions please send me an email great well well thank you very much for the feedback um do you need me for are you going to do a wrap up, Rachel. Do you? I was just looking at your timetable. Do you need me to be no for anything, or it. shall I? Okay. Well, thank you. I, and on, honestly, Rachel, thank you so much for inviting me. I really, you know, really very passionate about this subject. And if I can help in any way, then just let me know. So absolutely. Great. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. It's been great. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. 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 So I hope you really enjoyed that. I did. Uh, but I'm really interested in how we can how we can change our communication anyway. So, um, so yeah, as Craig's saying, anything that you'd like to see, any training that you'd like to have provided on the website, please get in touch with me, and um, we can see if we can sort that out. Any questions at all for me or Craig now? Now that Nikki's gone, is there anything at all? I know that you, you're asking about certificates, so if you email Craig, he will be able to do that for you. You'll find my email address will be in the in the chat box, and then uh, please feel free to contact me. Anything website related whatsoever. Uh, if you've got any questions, any queries, um, and please keep checking the website. Yeah, we we do try to put up a lot of information on a regular basis. Um, 
for example, this session has been advertised for the last three months. <laughs> just just putting that out there. But um, if you could, it would be wonderful. Really appreciate all the input and uh, everything that, that has been fed back to us in the past. It is all appreciated. We do try to work on things. Um, as I said in the email earlier, we've also noted um, the request from quite a few practices that future countywide PLT sessions will start at half past one. So that will give you time to wrap up your morning clinics, have some lunch, and those of you that need to have those um, those regular meetings before the, the PLT starts, we have listened and we'll make sure that that happens. I'll let you know what the next PLT content is going to be in, in due course, but it'll be in, it, it, you'll have enough time to organise yourselves around that. But um, yeah, I was really excited about that. I'm pleased how it went. So any feedback at all, please let me know. Um, so with that, any no more questions? I think we're done. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for the great turnout today. It, it's been very appreciated. I know oh, Rachel's just... put a lot of work into, into arranging this and uh, yeah. Very appreciated. I just want to say one more thing to our superstar, Natalia. Thank you so much for saving the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're an honorary training hub member now. <laughs> OK, bye, everybody. Speak to you soon, hopefully. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I'll leave the room open just for a short while in case people want to fill out those those polls. Um, but in the meantime, from me as well, thanks very much and take care. We'll speak soon.